what you gonna do? Crawfish, I've been watching you. Crawfish, cage in the light. Crawfish, looking in the hot spotlight. Cajuns uh, seem to have a strong feeling for the creature itself, the crawfish. They know that the whole ecosystem of the basin depends on the crawfish. Birds eat crawfish, and uh, fish eat crawfish, and bullfrogs eat crawfish, and people eat crawfish, and, and then crawfish eat fish, and the whole thing revolves around the crawfish. Crawfish is already a major industry in the state of Louisiana. Last year we had about 125,000 acres devoted just to the farming of crawfish. So we consider it already a major agricultural crop in our state. The Louisiana consumption of, of crawfish is kind of clouded. Uh, many people say that the, the consumption of crawfish in Louisiana has started with the Indians. However, most of the documentation we have been able to find does not substantiate that the Louisiana Indians ate crawfish. Uh, rather, the Louisiana in Indians used the, the crawfish as an ethnic symbol and a war emblem and a, what we call a totemic animal or a totem animal. The Homa Indians, which is basically a Mississippi tribe, used to be called the Scotchke Homa, and the Scotchke Homa, H-U-M-M-A, means crawfish red. The French settlers that came to Louisiana came from a region which ate crawfish, uh, or what they called crayfish, or acrivis, and the inhabitants of France were eating crawfish or crayfish in France long before America was ever discovered. Crawfish were first eaten down around New Orleans. Of course, that's where the first settlers were. And it seems that they were uh, first used in the form of a bisque. And the, um, the French bisque is a lot different from ours. It's more of a clear base than ours is almost a gumbo type. This uh, gourmet consumption of crawfish in the form primarily as crawfish bisque uh, kind of spread throughout Louisiana and was emulated by the Acadians in the Lafayette area, the, the, uh, what we now call Acadiana. Oh, with three cage, you would catch a, a big full sack those days. But now it's, it takes about 40K to take a sack, to catch a sack. But the old days, we didn't have no, no sale for them, though. Once in a while, somebody came and buy a sack or two, and they start to put them in a truck and go set them on the road, you know? That's where the crawfish business start. They start, oh. But 1938, he's done that. As the roads tended to improve in the 40s and in the 50s, we tended to get a lot better distribution of crawfish from the basin. But the truth of the matter was that a, a line from Lake Charles to Alexandria down in New Orleans was where the crawfish were marketed. We were talking about producing 99% of the product in the United States and consuming 95% locally. Uh, the trend is clear. The farm-raised crawfish uh, is going to be increasingly more and more important in the marketing simply because it's dependable. 
uh, the wild crop is not as predictable. Certainly it will always uh, have its place, but uh, in international or national market, it's going to be the farm-raised crawfish that stabilizes the whole industry. Well, being a crawfish farmer, it, it's uh, different than having a nine to five job. You, you have to be here every day of the year of the crawfish season, the walkie levees and crawfish. And uh, you really have your own hours. It takes about seven to eight hours to, for my full day, but it all depends when I start. You know, I could start at eight or nine o'clock. The uh, best time is real early in the morning because uh, muskrats and nutrients have cut your levee overnight and you're know, losing your water. The way the government's wanting to cut back on these programs and stuff, it's, it's not going to be profitable here in the next couple of years to raise rice. So double cropping rice and, and crawfish, it looks promising right now. Most of the crawfish fishermen that we deal with are very resourceful in that uh, everybody's doing a little bit different. Every bit, everybody's uh, farm is a little bit different. Everybody's pond is a little bit different. And they adjust to take into their own situation. A lot of farmers are, they're independent people. They're not gonna take everybody's word for what it is. They're gonna adjust to fit their own situation. If you take a look at a lot of the boats out there, very few of the boats are absolutely identical. Everybody's gonna improve, put their own little ideas into it, alter them a little bit to suit their own needs. When I started uh, farming 10 years ago, the problem was not enough supply. Then, then ponds kept growing and growing, and for the last three or four years, the problem's been in the ponds, we've had an oversupply and a depressed price. Now it seems like the, the, uh, the supply and demand is starting to become in kilt to where the processor can make a, a fair markup and the former can make a living. And uh, a lot of people now are just getting completely away from soybeans and limited on the rice, and their primary crop is crawfish. Before there were ponds, there was the basin, and I think it's the last stronghold we have of, um, of harvesters, men who can go out and take from the wild. They don't have um, the ponds to deal with and the levees and all. Nature is there, and it's, it's their bounty. They go, you know, they go and, and harvest. The Atchafalaya Basin is a most unusual environment. It's a, uh, it's a semi-wilderness area of 900,000 acres approximately. It has a, a fantastic variety of wildlife, uh, something like 170 species of birds, for example. Uh, it's, a, it's a place where a person who is willing to work eight or 10 hours a day can, can come and make a living. Working out, out here in, in the woods is an experience that uh, can't be compared with, uh, say, an office job. Um, if you like the outdoors, this, this is the, uh, the ideal vocation. But it's not, it's not something you, can, you make plenty of money at. Most crawfishermen don't rely solely on the crawfish for their, for their livelihood. It's, it's, it's really hard to, to make it that way. It's just, there's just not enough money and the season's not long enough to where a fisherman can fish, only crawfish, and pay his bills and raise a family and meet his house notes and whatever other expenses he might have. Uh, 
a lot of fishermen trap during the off season. Uh, they might do some carpentry work. They might uh, do other kinds of fishing, uh, net fishing. They'll, they'll do whatever they, they can do to uh, make ends meet until the coffee start running again and the season begins again. Out of the almost 400 species worldwide, the North America has about 250. Uh, Australia has a little over 100, and Europe has only seven species. So it seems as though we were really blessed with, with a broad variety. In Louisiana, we have about 30 different species of crawfish. Uh, certainly the two most important species are the White River crawfish and the red swamp crawfish. This is a red swamp crawfish here. And this is what uh, has made a lot of the restaurants in New Orleans famous with crawfish etouffee, crawfish bisque, and many other Cajun dishes. This is a nice size male right here. Here we have a female in berry. She has a couple hundred eggs underneath her tail. And these will hatch after a short period of time, after which the young will remain attached to the tail. So not very many eggs per female, but the survival is quite high because they take pretty good care of the young. When the Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station began crawfish farming research about 20 years ago, we were able to uh, produce a predictable crop year after year, so now we had a little bit of stability on a year-to-year -year basis. Research is extremely important to my job because I need facts and figures to be able to give that farmer to get into the business. You know, I mean, you have enough population here that you can fish, but that's, uh, you know, a good thing you didn't fish that stuff earlier because you wouldn't have had these there. Yeah. You know, that's... Look, look at here, now this here, immature male, well, see he's got spurs and all, but look at his color. He's molted. He's molted. He came out and molted. That's right. We've learned a lot from him, and the, the farmers are, are really listening to what the Extension Service has to tell us because we realize that we need to produce crawfish as efficient as we possibly can to hold down the cost of the commodity and still let the farmer make a profit. We're looking, as we have for many years, at uh, double cropping of rice and crawfish. That is, we grow a crop of rice, harvest the grain, put the water back into the field during the fall of the year. The crawfish that stayed underground, they were very obliging during the summer months. They come out of the ground and they feed on the decaying rice stubble. With that uh, system, through research, we have produced as many as 3,000 pounds of crawfish per acre per season. So as we say in Louisiana, this is a little lanyap. Uh, we not only grow the crawfish and rice together, we eat them together. Cajun cooking craze that's happening now is, is from the 60s. Uh, I thought before the research began too that it was something that, that dated back a long time, but it really seems to only have started in, you know, in the 60s. The uh, Brobridge Crawfish Festival back in 59 adopted the crawfish as their own symbol saying that they were the crawfish capital of the world. People have related to this festival for years. It was so inherently Cajun. And what it did, it expanded that market. It helped people to understand how good crawfish were, because in some situations, people may not have eaten crawfish. They went there, they bought some, they tried it, they enjoyed it. Antoine been cooking 
for about 150 years, been cooking crawfish. The recipes are from the old chef that came here before. You know, he brought his own recipe from France, so not a Cajun style, but a French style. The crawfish is very plain with the tourists come there. They really love it. And like I say, uh, if we could get uh, the season year round, we could sell a crawfish uh, from morning to midnight <laughs> all day long, you know, really. This, this is more or less like a weekly event for most people, most Cajuns down here. They do it during crawfish season, at least once or twice a week, they throw crawfish balls, invite the family over, friends, people like that. And it's just a way of life down here. First of all, you, uh, you ball them for about five minutes rolling ball. After that, you let them soak for about 20 minutes. Let three or four people try. They say, hey, that ain't right. You keep going with them a little bit more. And uh, after you drink a couple of beers, they all taste good, though. Boy, is that corn spicy. Woo, la la. Mm. But you, you find the biggest crawfish out of the batch, and you break it in half, and you suck the head. You peel the tail back, bite the meat. Um, um, savor the spices. Woo! Ooh, it is crispy. Ooh, The processor is a, a key ingredient in, in there because he is our marketing agent. The group of 80 or so processors in Louisiana, they are the businessmen. They are the ones who go out there and make the connections. They figure out the angle of marketing this stuff. If somebody wants to eat crawfish standing on their head, well fine, they'll sell, sell them upside down crawfish. So we depend upon the creativity of the processor and the marketing people to uh, move this stuff for us. And it's only with the development of a, uh, what we like to believe is a, a year-round system of production of crawfish that we'll, we're able to reach national markets like the Bennigan chain and uh, the Copeland chain that are featuring crawfish on a consistent basis uh, on a national level. The crawfish economy, a lot of people have uh, hopes that it will replace the oil economy and and uh, along with other seafood in Louisiana, such as crab and shrimp and oysters and so forth, will give the state uh, economy a boost that it's lacking since the oil business slumped. When you combine the wild and the farm-raised crop, uh, we might average 100 million pounds a year, which is about a $70 million industry. Uh, that doesn't include the value added. Uh, as far as uh, improving the economics of the state of Louisiana, we calculated that for each 100,000 acres of crawfish that uh, we're providing about uh, 4,200 new jobs, and that's just at the farmer level and the processor level. Um, I once took uh, a kind of survey in both of these towns and listed all of the businesses that that exist only because there are crawfish 
and in the town of Henderson, for example, there are 32 major businesses, uh, bait dealers, uh, processing plants, seafood restaurants, and so forth. Besides that, there are hundreds of fishermen, actual fishermen from Henderson. There are many um, people, hundreds and hundreds of people who peel crawfish for a living. There are people who repair outboard motors and people who sell fuel to fishermen and so forth. If it were not for crawfishing, Henderson and Catahoula would uh, practically have no way of, uh, of generating any economy at all. They, people around here are lucky that they could transfer from rice and soybeans to crawfish and allow them to stay on the farm, raise their family on the farm. And it's, it's a good, positive environment for the children, for the family. And uh, I, I think most farmers, if there's any way they can do it, they will stay on the farm. And aquaculture has given them another avenue to do that. It seems to be, there seems to be a real connection between the French-speaking Cajun culture and the Atchafalaya Basin and the crawfish industry. Those three things kind of tied together. And when uh, any one of them is changed to the extent that it loses its identity, uh, either the basin, the, the crawfish, or the Cajuns, it's going to be um, a, a sad thing for everybody, I guess. When I was a boy, that basin, there was no sand in there. It was deep water all over except the ridge. And what was catfish in there and all kind of stuff. Now it's all sand up. We are just a little a few swamp that's not sand up. And that's why those crawfish getting worse every year, you see, the sand taking the place. The Corps of Engineers has predicted that the Atchafalaya Basin, which is obviously filling up with sand and silt, may have a lifetime of 15 or 20 years, um, at least that long, maybe 25 or 30 years, before it's so filled up with sand and silt that primarily comes down the Mississippi River uh, that it will be unable to support uh, the kind of ecosystem that produces crawfish. In about five years, and crawfish don't live in sand. The sad part is that the increase in uh, the ponds is going to cause problems with uh, the wild crop. There's potential of uh, commercial fishermen in the basin going by the wayside for the advance of the pond industry, uh, especially if the basin doesn't come in. Uh, but again, those people are as much Cajun as a lot of the farmers, and they're resourceful, and they'll find either other products other species to work with or another line of work. The future outlook for the crawfish uh, industry in Louisiana is exceedingly bright. All we have to do is look at the trend. The acreage is exploding. That is, each year it's going up significantly. Uh, the fact that this is a gourmet seafood, that other states are discovering crawfish, certainly the market demand is going to be there. And we in the research uh, have simply got to keep pace with the needs of the industry. The uh, importance of aquaculture in America's agriculture is here to stay. Aquaculture is not a, a fad. Aquaculture will become more and more influential in the economy of states which have an abundance of water, such as Louisiana. Chicago, coffee 